I read that in like in section in the Federal Reserve Act, there's a section 30, and I think I got this in Ron Paul's book, mm-hmm. um, and the Fed. Right. You know, he's been working his whole career pretty much to try to audit the Fed and 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 the Fed and try to get back to constitutional money, and <sighs> since Congress has the authority to change the, the laws, like, do you think that there's a realistic chance that it can be changed constitutionally by Congress? Well, I wouldn't do it by Congress. Uh, Section 30 reserves the power of Congress to alter, amend, repeal the Federal Reserve Act. You know why that was there? Because Congress recognizes the Federal Reserve is a private organization or, or a structure of private organizations because all the banks are private organizations. And there's a doctrine in constitutional law which prevents uh, a legislature from changing a private corporate charter. This is the Dartmouth, famous Dartmouth College case, which occurred in the early 1800s. So what you find after the Dartmouth College case is the state legislatures and Congress would put these provisions in statutes in which they knew they were giving powers or privileges to private parties. They would put a reservation of authority for the legislature in these statutes saying, we can revoke or amend these privileges. And once it was there, that private party could not claim, oh, well, this, this contract can't be changed. This is not really a contract. Right? It's in the Social Security Act. As a, for instance, people think, so, oh, Social Security, this is a contract, they can't change, it's wrong. There's a provision in the Social Security Act so they can change it anytime they want. And they've done it over and over and over again. They could simply stop paying Social Security tomorrow, all constitutional because of the way they wrote the statute. Mm. All right, the difficulty they have is the same difficulty you would have if you went to the Supreme Court and said, we want you to declare this unconstitutional. How do you change it without deranging the economy? Right. National as well, potentially as international. Right? You can't just flip your fingers, snap your fingers, and change things overnight with some comprehensive statute. And all the Austrian economists, including Ron Paul, because I take him to be an Austrian school thinker, will tell you this. Right? It cannot be done. You can't exchange one system for another overnight. It has to be some kind of gradual process. So what I've been proposing for years is, look, let's go to the states. The states have the power to make gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts because they can make nothing but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. <laughs> it's a reserve right. power. So we want the states to pass a gold and silver legal tender act within their own jurisdictions. And they could start off with U.S. gold and silver coin. They could start off with foreign gold and silver coin. They can't mint their own coins, but they can use coins minted by someone else. And so now we have that kind of a system circulating within the states. And the proposal, actually, I put this up. We had it before the committee in the New Hampshire legislature. We had it for, before a committee in the uh, Montana legislature. Some other legislative people were looking at state legislative people. And essentially what it did was it created a, a circular flow, take a particular part of the tax structure of the state. Uh, we essentially used the, the, the tobacco taxes because those are sin taxes, number one. Most people don't look at those as, you know, the tobacco industry is something that's uh, particularly favored. And number two, the people who pay tobacco taxes are these corporations. They get mm-hmm. their tax stamps, they pay for the tax stamps, they put the tax stamps on their various products and the products come in for sale. Uh, so uh, those people could administer this uh, process very simple, very simply. And the idea would be that the tax people are required to pay in gold and silver coin to the treasury and the state. And then the treasury and the state offers to pay state creditors gold and silver coin on a first come first serve basis. And then supposedly, I would hope, the state creditors who now had gold and silver coin would begin thinking about using this in gold and silver contracts. Mm. And the tobacco people would have to get gold and silver coin to pay their taxes. So they would begin making gold and silver contracts. And slowly this would begin circulating through the commercial economy within that state. And the state treasurer would come back, I would think very quickly, back to the state legislature and say, you know what's happening here? We're getting X amount of gold and silver each year from these tobacco taxes, relatively small amount of tax. And it's going out the door as fast as it comes in. We want you to go to another area of our tax structure and require that gold and silver be paid. 
And slowly but surely, this would make a very large percentage of the state economy into a gold and silver economy. You have competition between the state economy in gold and silver and the state economy in Federal Reserve notes. And I wonder which direction that would go in. Uh, yeah, it sounds like if they adopt that, it's free market well, yeah, then you have sound money. That's it's, competition. competition. The, Austrian, the Austrian school people would tell you that under those circumstances, the free market is going to eventually dominate the unfree market. And, it's and the not... beauty of that system is that there's no way that Congress could interfere with it. Right. You're, you're saying that it's not like it's uh, it's not like it's an unconstitutional or illegal thing. It's actually just nobody's interest in doing it right now because of the way system is the way the system is and, and the money history has been lost and people just aren't as engaged anymore. Yeah, I think nobody really thinks about this. The example I give is, uh, on that point, is Texas. You know, Texas set up a state depository for gold, and actually now I think it operates so that anyone can put silver into it as well. And it started off because the state had a fair amount of gold in its uh, teacher's pension fund, some other pension fund that was held outside of the state. And some state legislators thought this was um, imprudent, they want to have control within the state. So they pass a statute, create a state depository, bring this gold back. And the depository essentially can function as a gold and silver bank now. Any citizen of the okay. state, I guess any citizen anywhere, can deposit gold and silver in that depository and it can be then paid out one way or another. So the last couple of years, well, it goes back now, maybe three or four years, uh, I and some other friends of mine in Texas uh, drafted some legislation that would enable gold clause and silver clause contracts to be uh, more easily used within the state and tied that into the state depository. So now they would have a depository, they'd have state statutes that dealt with gold and silver clauses protected by eventually the, the Supreme Court decisions that came from the 1860s and 1870s. And the idea was now they had a mechanism, the state depository, for deposits and payments. Now they had a legal system that could be effectuated through the courts for making these contracts effective easily. And once you gave that to people, you would hope that people would take advantage of it. Well, the difficulty was they never passed the, the, uh, what I would call the enabling legislation. That never got out of committee. And the problem here is, and I've seen this every time this kind of legislation, whatever it was that I've drafted, it goes into some committee and the people in charge of that committee give thumbs down. Why do you think that is? It's just Because they make calls to the bankers or the bankers make calls to them. I and mean, people know what bills are being put in. Right. I mean, the bankers look at this. Oh, you can't and I'll give you the classic example of this in Virginia. I've worked on this twice in Virginia. And I suppose other states have this same type of vision. Virginia has the ability for the General Assembly, the Virginia legislature, to enact bills for study commissions. And the study commissions usually contain a couple of legislators from each party and some experts or whatever. And they will deal with a specific issue. They'll study that issue. Maybe they'll hold hearings, maybe bring in experts or testimony, whatever it is. And then they will propose to the legislature what ought to be done or maybe what ought not to be done. Like I'm going to build a bridge over the dam, you know, in, in Danville or something, study that, come back and say, yes, we should finance the building of a bridge. All right. <clears throat> so I worked with this one legislator on a number of occasions to have a study commission to deal with this exact question. How could the Commonwealth of Virginia protect itself and its citizens against a very serious monetary and banking failure within the United States, whether it was a depressionary failure, hyperinflationary failure, whichever end of that spectrum you're on, how might it do this by coming up with a state alternative currency system? How this would protect the finances of the state, tax revenues, all right? How it would protect commercial transactions within the state, which are the basis of tax revenues and also of the well-being of the citizens. All I wanted to do was to have a commission set up and bring in some experts. And I was gonna get the, we had experts from George Mason University. I mean, these, these weren't people that were living in cardboard boxes on, on subway gratings, right? These are people who knew what they were talking about. We're gonna bring our own experts in, have the testimony. It couldn't be done. They wouldn't even do that. Oh, brutal. 
All right. They wouldn't even they wouldn't even listen to the possibility that this might be useful under some circumstances. And what I've always argued to people is, that, look, you, you pass one of these statutes, and if no one wants to use it, it just sits there like an insurance policy. All right? You get an insurance policy. You hope you don't die. You hope you don't have the you know, catastrophic car accident. But you have the policy in case those things happen. And that was the whole argument that I always made about these alternative currency systems. People might not want them. People might be perfectly happy with the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System might continue to function with a modicum of stability. But what if it doesn't? What is mm -hmm. your alternative? And the answer is you have nothing now. <laughs> yeah. right? You're at the mercy of fate, in a sense. The if you states, put a system like this in... The states are just people, kind of like following the lead of the Fed, I guess. Is that the system? Well, whatever. You know, they'll lead us over the edge, over the cliff, right? <laughs> whatever, wherever they take us. If you have this alternative system, some people will use it. There'll always be the odd individuals that will want to make gold and silver clause contracts. Do you think there's anything like to the, oh, sorry, go ahead, you're finished. No, but I, I'm going to say, but in, in, the, in the extreme situation, when enough people woke up and said, this is what we have to do to protect ourselves, or this is what the state treasurer said to the governor, this is what I have to do to stabilize my income, my real income here in, tax, in taxes. There's the system to use. It's already there. It's like the insurance policy. We don't have to call up Prudential and see if we can negotiate the policy when we've been diagnosed with terminal heart disease. Right. And the amazing thing to me is to watch how the, the legislative process suppresses this. In some instances, we weren't even able to get hearings because key figures in the committees to which these bills were assigned said no. And then you look at their backgrounds and you realize why they said no. In other instances, it was because of the composition of the committee, Democrats versus Republicans. Okay. In, in Montana, we finally got it out of committee and got it to the floor of the House of Representatives. And it was the Democrats and a few, what they call Republicans in name only, the, uh, that type of Republican, uh, who defeated it in the House. And it was like 52 to 48. I mean, it was close. Mm. Right, but didn't get out because that little, all the Democrats voted against it and a small group of Republicans voted against it, so it just disappeared. So those bills are sitting around, they're on the internet. You change the title of the state and you change the provisions where it talks about particular statutory sections and you could make the bill apply to some other, other state. They're kind of generic in that sense. But the problem is the, the legislat legislators don't understand it. They're a special interest to try to spike it every time it appears. Average people in the state don't have enough knowledge and interest to demand this from their legislators. Mm -hmm. The media doesn't talk about it. If you go to Wikipedia, you, hear, you read nothing but nonsense. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to, I mean, as in the Bitcoin space, you hear we follow a lot of financial news and macro news and, and, and worldwide news of currencies failing all over the world and everything. Do you think that there's anything serious to this narrative that Russia and China are hoarding lots of gold and they're trying to create like a gold backed currency to replace the U S dollar as a global reserve currency? Well, I'll believe it when I see the currency come out. First, they have to do it internally. Right. They have to bring their own internal economies on that gold system before they ever get involved in any kind of international transactions. And then, of course, the question is, if you're going to make gold cause contracts with foreign governments on a government-to-government -government level, or if you're going to make gold cause contracts on a commercial level, corporation in Russia makes a gold cause contract with Germany, how is that going to be enforced? What are the rules? If you go into a German court, how do German courts treat gold clause contracts? How do American courts treat gold clause contracts? If you made a Russian corporation or Chinese corporation makes a gold clause contract with, with an American corporation, going to be enforced in the American courts? I think the way that I was understanding that they're saying it's just going to be a, like a, a paper currency, but that's backed by gold reserves, just like the dollar used to be. I think that's yeah. the concept. Oh, well then I would just scoff at that. <laughs> no, no, no. The only way I, only way I believe that this was, if these people were serious, oh no, there's a gold, there's a gold currency, we're making gold and silver clause transactions. 
Right, because they can always we need, do... We don't need... Pay- Why would we need paper currency? The only reason you have paper currency is to have more paper than you have the gold or silver. Right, so they're going to rehypothecate, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the gold certificate and the silver certificates, there were trust funds in the treasury. They had to have an actual gold coin or an actual silver coin for each piece of paper they put out. And the reason that was put out was for convenience only. Right. People, rather than carrying around 50 silver dollars in a bag, <laughs> you have a $50 silver certificate, right? Right. That was the only reason. All right, I, I could understand that. You would have a paper currency, you would have electronic transfer or whatever, but it would have to be legally tied back to that particular piece of gold or silver in the Russian treasury. Or the, I wouldn't trust the Chinese, all right, but whatever, this foreign government's treasury. Right. But then the question always comes to my mind, what happens when one of those contracts is going to be enforced internationally? No problem within Russia. They would probably have the correct statute to do that. But you have a Russian corporation or a German corporation dealing with Russia, and the, corp- and, and the, the uh, uh, law of, of enforcement is specified in the contract to be Germany or France or whatever it is. Do those countries have a way of enforcing those contracts such that actual gold is going to be paid from their citizens? So you think that the likely scenario then is that we're not going to be moving to any kind of a gold standard any soon and the fiat experiment is just going to continue until it blows up, I guess? (laughs) Well, there may be other reasons that things blow up but before the fiat system does, but yes. Well, Dr. Vera, I've got... we We could do it in the United States right now, as I said before. We have the right to make gold clause contracts. The courts have already determined how those are supposed to be enforced. We have gold and silver coinage turning out of the, coming out of the treasury. And there's in, you know, international gold and silver coinage that we could be using as well, because a gold clause contract is not limited to U.S. gold and silver coins. Do you see any of that happening? And the answer is, yeah. well, no, if I it is, it's I don't, I don't see it. behind the scenes somewhere in the darkness, right? That is not happening. So you'd have to have a, ra- a rather large player to get that going. And that was my whole theory. If you get a state doing it, the state would become the pump primer on that system. If right. you had a foreign country doing it, right? But a state would here would be doing it within the U.S. legal system where we know exactly what's going to be done with a gold clause contract in terms of enforcement, assuming that the courts are going to be honest about it. When you start talking internationally, it raises another problem. So I would like to see it first in a state and then more than one state, and pr- putting pressure on Congress, so Congress might have to uh, authorize some agencies of the federal government to in- enter into gold clause and silver clause contracts, and the thing begins to spread like oil on water. And then at some stage, I would think that once that stabilizes within the United States, foreign countries, Canada, for instance, probably the first one, right? Mexico, maybe the second one, would be saying, well, we're going to make cross-border gold and silver clause contracts, because we know those can be enforced within the United States. We're not going to be cheated out of our gold and silver by some sort of legal tender screw up. So, which has happened before. That's why the whole thing collapsed because government stepped in and said, forget it. You may have a gold and silver clause contract in principle, but we're now going to change that to a legal tender contract and cheat you out of some value. So, is that, do you think that, I mean, that's what happened in the 70s, right? When the US went off the gold standard, everybody was under this paradigm that the dollar was backed by gold and redeemable by gold. And then Nixon just said, nope. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I forget it. Yeah, so, so that's what Roosevelt did. That's what Roosevelt did in, in 33. It was backed by gold. Federal Reserve note was backed by gold. And Roosevelt said, no longer. Oh, and by the way, we're depreciating the value of, of gold anyway from $20 to 35 